Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. I have reached the point where I need a haircut so bad that I'm just slapping a hat on. I'm totally going and getting a haircut today. It's like I absolutely have to do it. It's gotten kind of gross. So I'm decked out in my Isle of Man gear. I feel like I'm sponsored or something. A fan of the, a huge fan of the Isle of Man. Just an absolutely beautiful place on earth. I got to get back there soon. So let's go take a look at what questions y'all have upvoted the most over at uh, PollGab. If you've got a question that you want to post, uh, go ahead and put it in over there in the address on the screen. And the upvote, most upvoted question is from Mike. Mike says, we've got a few servers. How long should they work? What's the projected expiration date? I'm usually less worried about hardware, and I'm more worried about SQL Server support. How long are you going to be under support from Microsoft? And you didn't put how many, what version of SQL Server you're on. That's the place where I would start. Go to SQLServerUpdates.com and go take a look at when the SQL Server support expires. That's when you want to plan on either replacing the hardware infrastructure, because it's usually out of support around the same time or earlier, and then often moving to virtualization or the cloud as well. Uh, next up, Shalom says, what are the worst incidents that you've in uh, witnessed due to SQL errors being routed to a mail folder that nobody ever reviewed? So really, at the end of the day, what's the worst case that can happen for a database? Corruption. The worst case that happens for this corruption, and for me, it's even worse than accidentally deleting data, because for me, with corruption, often it strikes, and then people don't realize that they're gradually losing more data over time. If somebody does not oops, delete, if somebody has a bug in an app, usually they figure it out pretty quickly. But for corruption, it can drag on for weeks, months, and years before people realize that the data has slowly been hosed over time. I got all kinds of stories around corruption, but at the end of the day, it all boils down to that. Something was trash inside the environment. Bad firmware, a SQL server bug, you name it. Uh, bad networking cables when there was only one connected to the SQL server. All kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's just plain old simple corruption. Uh, next up, the big MC asks a question, and I actually saw this a couple of days ago, and I was like, oh, this is a really good question. I'm about to start a new job where I'm going to be looking after 100 plus SQL servers. I've been told that's a guess. I don't know. How can I reliably scan a network to find servers that other people don't even know exist? Okay, let's stop back for a second. Let's pretend that they did have a list. If they handed you a list of 100 SQL servers, are you going to fix them all on day one? What are you going to have to do? You're going to have to prioritize them. You're going to have to figure out what are the first servers that you should go tackle, because 100 SQL servers is tough for one person to walk in when it's their first database administrator, which is what it sounds like here. So what I would do is I would sit down with my manager and say, what are the servers that if they go down, the factory line stops working, we stop shipping widgets, we can't take orders from customers. What are the ones that if they go down, the business's incoming revenue stops? Those are the ones that you want to focus on, whether you've got a list or not. Now, odds are it's probably going to take you weeks or months to get those alone under control, much less all the other ones that you're going to find in the environment. And over time, you'll start to assemble a bigger list through things like help desk tickets when people phone in. A long time ago, I was a fan of network mapping tools where they would go out and sweep the network or sweep active directories to find all kinds of database servers. The problem is, is you're going to get all kinds of false positives. You're going to get all kinds of information. about. Oh, yeah, there's that SQL server that sits over in the DR site, and we haven't used that for 15 years. It's not even functional. You can just go ahead and delete it. But trying to track down those people and who owns the servers and what they're really being used for, and it's a development box that somebody has somewhere. That's a whole bunch of time that it's going to take you to process through that list. And the ROI just isn't there. So that's why you start by asking the business for what are the ones that would make the business stop. 
Uh, next up, Steph asks, what are your top most dangerous SSMS menu items that you shouldn't approach? For example, I once clicked on fragmentation. Why are you clicking on things? Seriously, why are you? What buttons should I not push? How's about you don't push any of them? How's about before you go and push something, you read what it does? There was a time in your career where you could randomly push buttons and see what happens. You work with databases now. That time is over. Playtime is over. Work has begun. So I would humbly suggest that before you randomly click on things, read the manual for the thing you're about to push and see whether or not you even need to push it. It's amazing to me. Next up, Tim says, Hi, Brent, with Windows uh, 2022, you can set the allocation unit size of a disk up to 2 megabytes. Is 64K still the best uh, practice for a SQL Server? You're welcome to experiment with your environment, with your own workloads, with your storage, with your storage drivers. Sometimes, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, vendors used to A-B test all kinds of things and come up with a guideline. These days, effectively, all storage access is random anyway. You're dealing with a shared pool of servers, lots of databases living on the same storage, access happening all over the place. It's not like there's really sequential access or scanning big chunks. Big data warehouses are different. Like if I say 10 terabytes and above, they often have their own dedicated storage. There often is sequential scanning of objects happening inside of there. But even those are falling out of favor now for like cloud-based data warehouses where they just dump everything in a data lake and tell people to go figure it out later. So the amount of work that it would take to do good A-B testing for your workload, for your hardware, for your storage drivers, the ROI isn't there. I haven't done that for probably five, 10 years now. There was a point where a company hired me to set up the perfect SQL server for their workloads. And I went and I was like, okay, so just so you know, if I go through and A-B test things like this, different RAID volumes, like RAID 5 versus RAID 6 versus RAID 10 and so forth, you're looking at like a two-week project. And then after that, I'm going to have this grid of, you know, here's, here's what you need to know about the storage. Here's the sweet spot for your workloads. And for them, a two-week project made sense. And they ended up writing the bill, chip writing the check for that and off we went for everybody else since now that i know that that's the the diligence that it would take in order to do it well everybody else is like yeah 64k sounds fine uh djw dgw in ok oklahoma city says do people actually use identity columns anymore yes what are the pros and cons of this practice? I teach you that in my mastering index tuning class in the clustered indexes module. It's about 30 minutes long and we go through the different pros and cons of why identity columns make sense, when unique identifiers make sense and so forth. Uh, next up, indexing for the win asks, the company I now work for is taking the decision to stop index rebuilds and only do stats updates. Wouldn't we benefit from rebuilds? Find out. What's the query that you think is going to go faster when indexes are rebuilt? Measure it before, measure it afterwards. Use logical reads to determine the amount of uh, data that's right, flying through SQL Server. Make a guess and find out. And if you don't know how to do that, don't do it. That's a good starting point. Next up we have, let's see, oh, Hamish asks, uh, it's very funny, Hamish said, what are the pros and cons of using the T-SQL print for debugging versus using table variables? It's so funny, when this question came in, I actually was like, oh, that's a great idea for a blog post. So in the next couple few days, I have a blog post going live on brentozar.com covering that exact thing. So good question there. It's beyond what I could do without, without writing demos. It's, it's beyond what I could answer quickly. Goodness, excuse me. Uh, next up, Max says, a friend of mine asks, what's better? Add a bit column and index it with 60 plus fields and or create a... So what's the problem that you're trying to solve? 
What's the query that you want to make go faster? Sound familiar, right? What's the query that you want to make go faster? Measure that. Measure the impact of that. How much faster does the index make it? And then how much does that at newly added index slow down inserts, updates, and deletes? And are you willing to live with that and space too as well? So I'll give you a couple of extreme examples. I have one client where they only load data overnight. And frankly, they don't care how long it takes. They have huge maintenance windows overnight. They only run like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. in one specific time zone. And they start the data loads as soon as the business is closed at like 7 p.m. in their time zone. They start loading the data in. They're done by like 10 p.m. They can index the bejesus out of that database. Theirs is in just about that same kind of size. Theirs up is over 10 terabytes. They can index the bejesus out of that database, and it doesn't really matter because insert, update, and delete speeds aren't a big deal. And two terabytes, just as a reminder, I mean, this is a, I don't know if you can quite see that there. This isn't even plugged in. This is my old backup drive, and I've been meaning to wipe that and throw it away. But it's not like two terabytes is really a, an unimaginable size these days. It's not that big. Um, so so uh, in that case, that client can over-index the bejesus out of it. I have another client who's basically a stock exchange. It's not an actual stock exchange, but they do the same kinds of things where every insert, update, and delete has to be insanely fast in order to keep up. They can't add any indexes to those tables at all. They just have to have really, really fast ingestion. And then they have other reporting tables that people read, and those are indexed all to, to get out. So you can see why it's hard for someone to give you a strict answer that the right number for indexes is always 14. Always. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, next up, we have John asks, so we'll make this the last question. John says, when you have SQL running on an Azure VM, is it acceptable to use the ephemeral drive for TempDB? That's a great question, and I go into it in my training class, Running SQL Server in Azure and AWS. It's a one-day class that goes into how SQL Server works on VMs up there, when it makes sense to use Amazon RDS, when it makes sense to use Azure. Azure SQL DB, the different flavors of Azure SQL DB, and where I think cloud databases are going over the next 12 to 24 months. It's an easy one day class. You can knock it out. It's about 200 bucks US. And if you're asking that question, odds are you're going to ask a lot of other similar questions that are covered in that class. To learn more about it, go to brentozar.com and click training up at the top of the screen. When you buy that class, that pays for my haircuts. You have not bought that class, therefore I have to wear a hat. Please help me not to have to wear hats. <laughs> it's not true, I can totally afford a haircut, it's just me being lazy. The last this weekend, I just did video games. I played video games, played Dead by Daylight like the whole entire weekend. Dead by Daylight's uh, scores reset on the 13th of every month. And so whatever score you have on the 13th, you get a bunch of bonus points for that. So I was racing this weekend to get my score up before the 13th. So I got some friends coming to town next week and I won't be playing any video games for while they're here. Then after that, I'm going up to uh, Chicago and then to Michigan to see my dad's side of the family. I uh, haven't seen them in, oh man, it's been like two has it been before the pandemic? No, I saw him after. Yeah, no, I saw him during the pandemic because they came down to Mexico to see me. Uh, but it's been like, uh, I think like a year since I've seen him. So what am I doing? Of course, I'm going up there in January when the snow is uh, totally thick. I should probably keep the long hair to keep me warm. I'll have to think about that. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I will see you all at the next office hours. Adios.